Good evening, fellow heretics. Welcome to tonight's show. I am your host, Captain Dadpool. And I'm Natty Nat. And, and this you are watching Nerds, Nerds and Heresy. Heresy. Hold on to your butts. Well, I fucking flawless execution there. <laughs> that was. We tried so hard. Oh, that was that was good. It was so good. We already got a super sticker. Anton already. I love you, Anton. Thank you so much for being. Hi, I love you too. You, you're the goat. You really are. You are awesome. Um. So our our host tonight is having some technical difficulties. She will be joining our us guest, momentarily. Our guest. We're the hosts. Our guest tonight. That they host. Yeah, I'm a guest. Yeah, our, our guest and I just had like internet hooked up in her house today. Um, and they're getting it figured out. They're going to be joining us momentarily. So for now, figured we'd start the conversation with just us. And yeah, what happened on your live the other night? So th this is kind of what got me thinking about this topic. Um, someone asked me uh, if I consider Christianity to be a cult. Um. And the thing is, by the strictest adherence to the definition, yes, Christianity is considered a cult because the definition of a cult is a system uh, of religious beliefs. But it, it's such an ambiguous word and such an ambiguous definition that it can mean all kinds of different things. And the way we think about the word cult today is not – historically is not the same as it would have been understood. So like – 2,000 years ago, more than that, um, there were personality cults. There were cargo cults. There were uh, emperor worship cults. Uh, so there were tons of different cults in the ancient world. Uh, but you would never think of them as the kind of cult that we would think of them as today. You know, When you think about the word cult today, we think about not just a system of religious beliefs, but we think about a system that isolates the outside world from you, that controls every aspect of your life, every aspect right. of your thinking process in order to mold your brain into thinking a certain way. That's right. the way we think of a cult. We think of Scientology, uh, Mormonism, certain sects of Christianity, um, the Halley's Comet cult, like th th these like extreme examples. So when we say Christianity is a cult, we kind of subconsciously associate that definition with that. And that's just not something I kind of wanted to yeah. talk about. And before we even get to the, um, the evolution of it um, is something that Richard Dawkins said back in, I think the eighties and it's turned into its own cult, I guess you could say um, the word meme yeah. Meme is just supposed to be an idea. That's all it is. Meme is an yeah. idea. It's an idea of a picture. It's something that like says a statement like pictures worth a thousand words. Here's a meme. This is the idea and you can interpret it how you like. Right. I think that the way that we use the term meme nowadays is similar to the way cult was thrown around back then. That is a great example. I didn't even yeah. think of that. But you're actually right. No, you were talking about it. it. It literally just popped in my head. Um, but I wanted, yeah. So using that as an example, uh, as as an idea that can be interpreted in many ways. God damn it! And seeing how seeing how society looks at a cult, at the word cult, and has its own hey, has its own, uh, I guess, unofficial. Uh, oh no an unofficial understanding within society that makes cult such a negative and terrifying term. Um, it's really, it's really not. And it's, this is, this is what, this is kind of where we're going with, with this whole uh, idea is, so Dawkins does this like 30 years ago, comes up with this term meme, although meme technically was invented a long time before that. But that we did, did Dawkins come up with that term? He started using it. Uh, he was the first one to start using it on a regular basis to describe ideas, but it wasn't the first. It wasn't the first use of the word. Hold on, I so want to He, he, he right. normalized the phrase, or he made the phrase mainstream. Yes, I did um, not know that. Yeah, kind of fun fact. Huh. Origin of interesting. Meme. 
Let me see. Uh, so it's Greek, right? For uh, Mimera or Mem Memma? Memma? It's probably M I M E M A M. Memea. Memea. That's what I'm going with. Okay, sure, Memea. Um, but yes, the meme isn't new. It actually, oh, sorry, I said 80s. I'm wrong. It's 70s. Um, the meme, the concept of meme isn't new. It dates back to the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins using it in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene Theory, which is the first time that I came across that word back in high school. And then the selfish gene theory. Yes, I've heard of this. I'm going to summon what? Hey, there's our guest. Oh, oh, the meme, meme, meme. meme. See if oh, she's here. Wonderful. So, Hello, I miss. the point Hello. I'm trying to get at is that words change and their use, the use and the amount that you use a certain word can cause the language and the use of that word to change definitions over time, which is in and of itself a type of evolution. Joining with us tonight is Imus who is a linguist and she is amazing. I must, can you give us a little bit of a background so that we can talk a little bit about what you do and why it's so important? Cause it's an amazing, amazing topic. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me on. So I'm a speech pathologist. Um, I currently work um, in a medical setting. So I diagnose and treat mostly swallowing disorders in adults. Um, but I have a master's degree in communication science and disorders. So um, I, I do a lot of diagnosing and treating language disorders as well. So I kind of describe it like um, we study language backwards. <laughs> so linguists kind of look at like language and then like describe it. And I kind of look at like language is already there and then like back it up so that we can like fix it, which I'm going to talk about like wording of that in a little bit. But yeah. No, I love that. Um, no, so that's that's brilliant to start just with that uh, that description of how you think, because as an anthropologist, we think of an origin and then we work our way up. But as a pathologist, as as a speech speech pathologist, as a speech pathologist and linguist, isn't it fun that that actually just a side note? Isn't it fun that that uh, uh, that entire genre of uh, study? has some of the most fun words to say. <laughs> Just all of the fun. Anyway. <laughs> I'm always like, everything in the hospital has to have a fancy name. So I give them the name first, and then I say, this is what that really means. So. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is the thing. It's um, kind of like being a theologian. Right? <laughs> we have no, all these fancy jargon. words. and That's the technical term for it, jargon. Jargon, yep. Jargon, yep. The fancy words. Um, but yeah, the, the whole concept of how a scientist thinks isn't, I guess this is a generalization I wanted to throw out there. People assume scientists always think in scientific method theory, like boom, 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 boom. Now we do apply that, but it's, it's an open analogy. It's an open, uh, formula and we can work backwards with it. You start with the effect and work your way backwards. Yes. The answer. yes. I no, you have to call me master. <laughs> master Imus. Master Imus. I'm actually. Is that how you pronounce it? By the way, I've never asked. Is it Imus? Yeah, Imus. Yeah. It, okay, nailed it. All right. It's it's a play on my real name. That's okay. That's what my name is. It's something it's people used to call me that like drove me nuts. So I I like switched up the letters and took control. I of like it. it. I like I, it. But, I used to yeah. be called, uh, uh, my, my last name is Brock. And when I was in the military, people called me Brock Orama. Uh, <laughs> so my, my first, like, uh, like my first gamer tag is Brock Orama because of that. That's funny. <laughs> that, so, yeah. is, that is cute. That was, no, that was, so that was I, 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 the guy who came up with that broke his spine after he fell out of a guard tower. Anyway, fun story. Oh, I feel like a lot of <laughs> topics. Oh um, my! <laughs> the hospital I work at, um, one of the hospitals in the system is level one trauma. So I've worked with a lot of falls and broken necks and stuff. Someone said jargon is a nice shortcut between peers. Yeah, it is. And I speak in jargon all day because I'm sitting in an office full of other people with the same education as me, um, talking about the same three things over and over again. So. Oh. Which actually, I'm glad that jargon's been brought up a few times because 
fun fun fact for those of you that don't know uh working as a geologist and working as an anthropologist fucks with me and the reason why is because the jargon between those two correlate and they use the exact same words to mean two totally separate things oh, like the term imagine. historic it means nothing to me by the <laughs> way real quick uh i must have you met nat officially yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay all right yeah We've been sending each other videos for the past few weeks. Yeah. So it's actually pretty bright. Hi, I, I, I actually love, I love the videos she sends me. They're very uh, quippy and, you. and smart and I love it. Thank you. Hi. Um, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because speech pathologists and linguists also get into it. Um, there's oh, a really yeah. great, um, content creator called Maddie Wex, if anyone wants to follow them on um, TikTok. And she and I have gotten into some rows <laughs> about some things that we agree with, we disagree what a, about from a scholarly consensus. What a polite way to say argument is yeah. some rows. Yeah. <laughs> some throws, yeah. some hey. spats. All in, all in good nature, nothing. No, uh, no, no, it's, it's, no. It, that's that's the fun part. I mean, they didn't create an entire account based off of a rock that they think that you misinterpreted. Um, no. So that's totally fine. Like oh, that's the, the turtle rock. The turtle fuckers. Uh, I'm leaving that be. I just no I think a turtle there. shell with like carvings in it. No, it's no carvings. No carvings at all. It's it's a it's a crinoid catalyx. It's multiple multiple crinoids all set together but the shell like it, it's polished and like looks like a little turtle shell but oh, okay. it, it's not yeah those uh those crinoids they'll uh they'll get you you gotta watch out for those anyway they the, the guy <laughs> the guy took it and ran with it and it's just it's kind of been a pain in my ass for the last year so <laughs> but anyway talk about like having your words misinterpreted um anywho so, so we're here to talk about the origin, or at least the evolution of language. And before we get started on that, because of the jargon between our studies, between what we study, I kind of want to come to a uh, an equal grounded definition of language sure. and of evolution, if that's okay. Unless you have other words that you want to put um, put forth as well. But I think those two are going to be used a lot, and I don't want them to become blurred. Sure. And you know, taken well, in. Like I have words. probably five or six words that I want to go over to see. Let's sure fucking do it. Page. I got sticky oh, notes. Yeah. I am ready <laughs> to like make sure that I am using the word in accordance to your your profession. Because we have, we have no agenda friends. here, no schedule. <laughs> no, no, that's a worry. What happens happens. So, Talk so, to me. So let's let's do communication communication oh i like that one is anything that successfully i guess conveys a message conveys some kind of information successfully successfully conveys. yeah that um so <laughs> that's why people still can't communicate ah, ah, that's so funny Sorry. if i point to this this is communication i'm gesturing to an object to bring your attention towards it but it's not language. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I like and that's like it. universally recognized. You could go right. to anywhere in the world is, and point at something. This is where we were getting with the whole and picture they're thing before. And we're going to get into that. But yeah. yes. Okay. And just to be clear, um, we are used to, what's what I call it, an index finger, right? Indexing this way. Um, but in certain cultures, you're supposed to index with an open hand, especially if it's directed to a person, because this is like considered like an object or like punitive in nature. Um, so we have to acknowledge that cultural, cultural <laughs> that gesticulation um, yeah. varies across cultures, and there are awesome. certain gestures that are considered like rude in one culture, and they're completely acceptable in another culture. Um, yeah. You know so, what's, what's interesting about that? I, I got to interject here. In the military, sure. it's it's considered rude to point. Mm. so you use what they call a knife hand mm -hmm. so yeah. you and say you, you you fucked up it doesn't matter like you, you fucked up right you over there you have to go so like you that. go over there and like you it's you will never find someone in the military like point with their index finger yeah that's a because good point. it's rude so yeah well not to a person they will point if it's indicating to a thing on the ground like that like that 
but if it's a person, it's a yeah, if it's well, an yeah. officer, it will always be a karate chop, though. Like, if the guy's an officer, it's karate chop or nothing. Also, um, when I was in Japan, I noticed that when people self-index, they point to their nose. So that's, like, another example of how, like, they don't, like, they wouldn't say this. Like, we tend to do this or this. Yeah. But they point to their nose to ind indicate themselves. They also cover their mouth when they, like, laugh or. Uh, right, because showing too much teeth is considered weird to them yeah it's like not um, not auspicious in like buddhism yeah it's it's <laughs> sorry i'm digressing but yeah well no it's it's almost like okay so i want to get into this i do let's finish there's with so the much going on right now i'm literally yeah there's so much going on i mm, i'm going to take a note we're okay. going to come back to this topic but i want to keep going with the definitions before cool. we press on uh mm -hmm. in that in that subject so what's another word you want to define so speech, speech is like physical production of sounds with your mouth. It is a separate thing. It, people try to like often conflate speech and language and use them interchangeably, especially when they're not in their field. So I want to be clear about like that speech so, is like the physical production the speech, of sound. Speech and language are two completely yes, different things. They're different. very, very different. Yes. Yeah, there's a reason why I was like, we need to do some definitions before we get going. Because once we do, it will curtail and just go crazy. Sure. Um, yeah. Now, here's my question with it. When it comes to speech, does it have to be physical, represent, uh, physical production with your mouth? Or it, can it be with... Cause I know like you can do sign language. Like I, sure. that's not real sign language. I just, I, I don't know sign language. <laughs> so no, I'm just like so making hand gestures. We do have a few outliers among human languages that don't use what we would consider speech sounds for this definition. You have like ASL. So yeah. that would be, you know, finger spelling. And then there's a few languages that use like humming and whistling. Um, and they, I mean, they are, I would consider them speech sounds. Um, other people might not, but okay. I would consider them speech sounds. So, with the, this uh, has to do with like bipedalism and like we're gonna get there, but yeah, no, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, I just wanted I wanted that clarification because mm -hmm. I I know that there are some languages where snaps are a thing versus like whistling. Yes. Which, yeah, and because yeah, the the shepherds, the whistler shepherds that like uh, it's an entire island that just fucking talks to each other via whistling, which mm -hmm. is crazy. An entire language. Um. Anyway, next next definition. What do you want to hit me with? Um. So, ooh, that bottle stop. Click the. Oh, Oza. Yeah. Oza. Yeah. And then there's uh, the swallow one. That. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's like my favorite. So, like, I think the the most classic example of that is the kung, right? Yeah, down in, yeah. Down X H O S A for anyone who wants to Google that. Awesome. Kung. There we go. Oh, okay. But yeah. Anywho, so what was the next word you want to define? So language. <laughs> language. I like Ooh, it. Oh, it's scary, isn't it? We're going off your definition. And I will try my best to use that within my discussion and questions. So I think the major issue is that, that in order for something to be considered a language, it has to meet certain criteria, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and the easiest way to kind of define the criteria that makes a language, I think, is Chomsky and recursion. So let me be like clear about what that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so most languages, there is one questionable exception, and we'll get into that because it's very anthropologically interesting as well, um, demonstrate recursion, which means that a language has a finite set of symbols that can be used in an infinite number of combinations to express an infinite number of ideas. So you can talk for a hundred years in your life, and you will always encounter sentences or phrases and generate sentences and phrases that have never been generated before in your experience. And that's because embedding is possible. You can technically talk in one continuous stream forever and still come up with new combinations. What do you mean by embedding? So I can say that Captain Dadpool is sitting in a chair and has his hair up in a ponytail and has a beard and he's white and he's a man and is wearing a necklace and has a microphone. I can just go on and on and on and on and on. And there's no 
grammatical, and we're going to get into that in a second. There's no grammatical or semantic constraints to that because even if I ran out of vocabulary words to describe you, I can describe the color, I can describe the shape, I can just is all these different. Then I can get abstract with what I'm talking about. So he has a vibe. It's like what's a that? Aura. What's that? I was like, he has a vibe, an aura, <laughs> an aura right? There's a feeling that I get it's what when I'm, I'm going describing for. him. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the like, levels of abstraction like, that come with language as well. And we're going to talk about like abstraction and concrete and how that makes art different from language. But yeah. So it is language has to have a, a, a finite set of symbols. Shall we that, say, can, can we call hello. it a system? Would it be okay if we called it a system of symbols or a system of uh, like symbols and rules? Or do we want to take the rules out? Just symbols. So I'm going to get to that in a moment about the rules. I want to talk okay. about that because it's really important. This is a great question. Have you ever attempted to create or learn a Conlang? Um, I haven't learned a Conlang, but I have written three of them. And if you're interested in that, um, I'm happy to share that. There's some content on my page about it, but I wrote a fantasy book, and there's three languages that I created from scratch cool. in that book. Okay, so so what what is a Conlang? It's not that I need an explanation. I totally know what a Conlang is. It's just for the benefit of. <laughs> Of uh, people who are watching, you know, just do, do you want to like explain? It's, it's a what made that up means? language. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like I mean, like Tolkien Elvish or um, yeah. um Dothraki is probably the most commonly. Dothraki um, is very. Dothraki, um, the, yes. The the speaking at uh, Atlantean when the movie Atlantis came out with all those symbols and the dots and everything, which was um, shockingly sim. Oh, I can't think of the word for it. To the the grid pattern writing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about with that? Because the alien movie, you mean? The, was it alien or was it the contract? I think it was called. No, no, that was the circle writing, though. Yeah. yeah, that's not the same as the grid. Um, the grid is oh fuck, it's hold on. The grid is like this. Do you do you need to share your screen or something? <laughs> So the grid is like this. So A wow, would actually like be this. And then B is that. I'm not familiar with this at all. Oh, we can talk about that. Okay. okay. So that's that's a thing. That's a thing that's used a lot when it comes to elvish or when it comes to fantasy writing when come like in within novels in order to create characters but still use the same vowels. And the same consonants that we use in our language, right? Okay. So I would consider that code a code. Yes, but it's not its own right. constructive language because it it fails to alter a syntax. So we have to get to like a lot of words here, right? Yes. However, if you create a language based off of our own letters and consonants, but used in a way that mm -hmm. is yeah, used in the way that's like say French. That's, that's a bad example. Um, I'm going to fucking stick with Tolkien on this used okay. in a way that's Elvish, sure. but you don't write it with our consonants. You write it with that grid pattern, still right. consisting of the same consonant sounds, still consisting of the same vowel sounds, adding a few more in fact, because of the, um, cause like he has like the, the end with the little nye, um, on it and, and all of that. And, it's it's rearranging our language and building on to a new one. So it is a conlang. I mean Tolkien's Tolkien's yes. like conlang. Yeah. Sure. I would consider Tolkien's systems to be conlangs. I just want yeah. to be clear okay. though. Okay, that's what I was wondering. It, it's um, certainly a another thing to discuss. A fun later. thing to do to go in and like make a code based on the rules that are already set forth or rather the features. I'm gonna be very careful about how I say that. The features of English. But right. when for something to truly be a conlang, someone has to go in and create new vocabulary words and and decide on different systems of syntax. I mean, we're getting into very a lot of jargon right now. But I want to be clear: consonants um, and vowels are words to describe sounds. Right. When we talk about writing systems, each individual letter, if the language is using letters, right, are graphemes, and then you have other systems of writing like. Uh, they're more pictograph, like Chinese. Um, I'm simplifying that. No, no, that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, so so again, I'm, I'm going to jump back again. So language, can we say language is a system of symbols? 
like an agreed upon system of symbols or a yes, that are finite that finite, can make okay. infinite combinations finite system of symbols okay so i'm 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 loving this i, I really am but i feel like we're kind of going all over the place it sounds like we are. I promise you we're not. We're literally just making a definition. This is how we have to, in order to communicate these ideas, we're going to have to be able to understand. Otherwise, this is going to get way messier than you were ever going to believe. Okay. I'll, I'll trust, trust you all then. Trust the evolutionary, like tr trust the people that deal with evolution. Like we have to set these, these standards up in order to actually have the discussion. But yeah, so language was one of them. So system of symbols infinite infinite possibilities um did you have another word that you wanted to define before i wanted to just make my um professional viewpoint clearer that i'm a linguistic descriptivist and when i say that i look at language and i try to describe how it works what it does and what it might tell us about the people who use it because language is culture let me make that very clear that language is culture. Language is culture. That's good. Um, it's it's like the square is a rectangle thing, though. Language is culture, but culture is not language. There's yeah, it, square is a rectangle. There, but a there rectangle. is there is culture in language, and language is culture, but right. not all culture is language. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm drinking rum as always. <laughs> We're gonna get him so drunk tonight. He's going to be so confused. <laughs> I'm I'm already halfway there. <laughs> So this is in contrast to linguistic prescriptivism that asserts that somehow speech and language possesses correctness. So the, e the easiest way to explain this is like the person in the comments that like corrects your spelling on something or they like tell you pronounce something wrong. Right. Um, there's the rule enforcers and then there's the understanding of the rules. And it's important to acknowledge that linguistic prescriptivism has a function and a place when we talk about the preservation of language and the pres preservation of cultures whose language is in danger of dying out due to colonialism or evangelism or something like that. Um, okay, that, we also that's need great, to have, what's that? That's a, that, that? That's a great topic to talk about because from what I'm observing, given the era of the internet, is the the language is changing very, very fast, much faster than it ever has in history. Would well, that's you agree with access, that? Yeah, it reaches everywhere now, mm -hmm. and it and it changes like at at any moment, someone can change the the definition of a word, and. That affects the entire dialogue, uh, and, and and it's weird. It's hard to keep up with. Um, sure, and we're, we're again, watching these we're things. We're watching these things happen from the sidelines because of how we're almost shifting back to a primarily written form of communication because of like texting and all that. Um, but th that that change that rapid evolution of language is probably very reminiscent of what has occurred over time in populations we just don't have records of it right that's a bold yeah. claim but i'm sticking with it um, um it's it's not it's not wrong it is bold but it's not wrong because we don't this is one of those we don't have evidence for it yet but right. The likelihood is that we will find evidence for it and that becomes like evidence evidence like without evidence can we say it's a truth no. not exactly but at the same it's time my hypothesis it's, it's that, like a missing link scenario let me be clear it is my hypothesis that the rate at which language is evolving currently in the advent of social media and the internet i accept this likely mimics or emulates the evolution of verbal language in ancient cultures, but not written language, because you don't have a society that is primarily literate. So while we might be able to look at- Hold on, we- Oh man. 
So, we don't so have a society that's primarily speaking, literate. Archaeologically you know speaking, we can examine writing systems from about. That's a brilliant. Brilliant. Ten thousand years ago, I'm I'm being really really generous with that. About no, I I get that, but like, sorry, I just I okay. just had an anthropology aha moment. Yeah, that like, we can examine those things and say, hey, Sumerian looks a certain way between these time slots. But, but at the same access, time, who has yeah. access to Sumerian writing? Who is making these 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 markings, right? Like how what percentage the of the least. population is using the markings versus the verbal? Right. And we have no records of like literally we have no records. No, we don't. I mean that's that's part of like oh, my issue. Fuck my thing. life. This just made <laughs> Oh so I don't okay, to be clear, when it comes like I fucking study rocks. Yeah. Uh -huh. So a lot of the time if I see an etching, like rocks fucking talk to me. That's its own language in my opinion and i will sure. say that there are symbols and shit that work with that um yeah. i can look at a way a rock is scratched and be able to tell you what you did it where it came from yeah. how it was used like all of this shit but it it just it i'm sure like it's it's tough it's crossed my mind before that that humans like it was a small percentage that was art like there was a small percentage that were were were, were uh literate but even then, it's oh God. That's a, that's just such a big phenomenon. Just I think a more accessible example of this would be like the Constitution of the United States, right? So, right, we can look at that document that is read aloud and written the exact way that it was the day it was made today. If I look up the Constitution on line, it's going to oh, be. Oh, that's a great right? example. And we still read it like that and can understand it. There are nuances of that language that would become difficult for, pe for people to get because it's not exactly how we talk nowadays. We still understand it. But it is not in any way, shape, or form reflective of the way people talk now, as right. well as it's not very reflective of the way laws are written now. Right. So we yeah. have to apply that same sort of evolution of, of both language and the written component of language, because not all languages have writing systems, I'll be very clear about that, to antiquity. Well, I'm gonna just make it the antiquity. So to get back yeah. to what I was saying before is that linguistic prescriptivism says that language can possess correctness and it has a place, but I think that using linguistic pres prescriptivism in everyday communication is like an exercise in pedantry because if there was truly a communication breakdown in an exchange, like there was some video that what you guys made during the con that atheist was spelled wrong or whatever. Everyone knew what it said. It's not, it wasn't unclear what the message was, right? Oh yeah. That was Baff and, um, ba no. I think Baff made that video. So it was made at like Jeff's house, I think, or something, but like yeah. someone spelled atheist wrong there. It's like, it, it, everyone knew what it said. If it was that unclear, it would have been like, hey, what does that mean? Like, you wouldn't be like, oh, it's still wrong. Like, no, <laughs> that's not. So anytime someone goes in and does that, if you're able to tell somebody, oh, that's spelled wrong, it means you knew what word they meant. So it's not a communication breakdown, therefore it's not wrong, because my philosophy is if it's understood, it's correct. If it's understood, it's correct. That is, that does define you more of a speech pathologist than a linguist. If, that is amazing. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's not wrong. I've always, I've always kind of had a hard time being able to describe the difference, but that was like on the nose, like bingo. That's yeah. that's where it changes. Is sure. is the commu the the capability of communication? Yes, <laughs> like, yes. you can communicate things that are that are understood, but are from prescriptive perspective linguistically wrong or somehow possess incorrect. Um, I, love, I love everything happening in the chat right now. There's so many, there's so many examples. Yeah, there, there is good stuff happening in the chat. I, like, I'm really happy with the examples they're throwing out. You guys are killing like, it. Yeah. I, oh, oh, yeah. There's so like, oh, yes. yeah, like dialects of Cajun. I, I actually completely forgot about the comment section. I've been ignoring it. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. It's okay. Well, so here's so the dialects of Cajun are fun yeah. because you have. Uh, you have colonial Cajun, you have Bayou Cajun, you have, uh, fuck, um, Creole, uh, you have the uh, Ebonics Cajun, which is really, really interesting. I mean, if you ever, if you haven't heard it before, it's really, fa it's fucking fascinating. Um, 
and this is all just like within the Baton Rouge area. <laughs> like I, I, no, I've come across great, all of these. This is a great point. And it's actually something I wanted to ask you about because I wanted to get like your perspective, like from okay. the field. I'm so, down. When we think about um, a, a city, a major city um, okay. where people are like on top of each other, right? You got thousands, millions. In New Orleans. People, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, do you typically think that all those people are going to share a language, right? But that's not the case at all. You actually find the if, opposite to be true. The more if it was a have, stagnant population. Okay. So this is going to get into population dynamics. Right. If we had, yeah, and it doesn't even matter if it's people or not fucking use cheetahs if we wanted to, I don't care. Or gazelle. If we had a stagnant population, the same group of people, like the two people will reproduce and you have 2.1 children mm. how are the fuck that works <laughs> or like 2.5 or whatever i always want uh, to give birth to one tenth of a child yeah right <laughs> everyone wants that and then like 10 couples get together and they like puzzle piece it together hey yeah. look an extra child and then you have 11 kids there's a, anyway. there's a horror movie like that called may if anyone wants to watch it <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah he like, builds uh, a we don't let us put babies up anymore though now we can't do that anyway um <laughs> Side note. Oh hmm. uh, so, yeah. So if a, if a population doesn't change in that the same people reproduce the same number of people, which reproduce the same number of people, no one moves out, no one moves in. It's just like a constant repetition continuing on. I'm not getting into genetics about this. This is where like de there are population density can cause a bottlenecking uh, issue, which is why I said the word cheetah is because I automatically think bottlenecking when it comes to cheetahs of Dr. Frankenstein's family. Yes. Basically, I'm talking about if you had like 1 million people giving birth to 1 million people as the next generation, giving birth another million people, but those people die at the same time as the other ones are born, and you just like end up with this constant variation. Sorry, this constant, not a variation, uh, within a city limit. You can assume they will all speak the same language. You can assume that their education will be fairly similar throughout. You can assume that they're going to have similar meeting practices, similar dialogue, similar uh, uh, civil civilization, cultural biases. Okay. Like if it's all white, mm, I'm going to fucking do it. I wasn't going to. I'm going to do it. If do everybody it. was blonde hair and blue eyed, they would think that blonde hair and blue eyes are normal. Right? If everyone was blonde hair and blue eyed, then you bring someone new in. They have brown hair, blue eyes, but brown hair. Right? That person's weird. Out of the norm. They're an outlier. Immediately. So imagine this though with language. You are... Everybody's speaking English. One person comes in speaking Spanish. Doesn't matter if they came from an entirely speaking Spanish location and they think everyone here is weird. You are looking at them as an outlier and they only see, they're seeing exactly what you're seeing. The difference being that there's more of them and less of, of you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about what I understand to be true from like a pathological standpoint and then maybe we can like merge our two thoughts together yeah yeah um, easily because what you're describing is sort of different from like what I understand and that that's new, might be my own misinformation I, I think I'm just I'm using genetics as a way to explain the language which is kind of weird like just like a similar trait but yeah let's let's go, right, go there's, back there's like seven things in my mind right go now on. <laughs> go 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 tell me so one all neurotypical people, let's like, we're going to use that like very vaguely, right? Are born with the capability to learn any language in the world. That's one of our problems, right? And it's the language that they're exposed to that they, their brain specializes in. And then eventually you become, a, after you get past the critical period, it's very difficult to learn another language. Right. So yeah. whether you're born- it's right, easier when you're younger. Anyway, anyway, like I could be born in the United States if I get adopted by a family in Finland, I'll speak Finnish. And they're like, there is no issue that I was born in one place and can learn another right. place. Like it's not your your race, um, your genetics and stuff don't preclude your ability to learn one language or the other. Right. So let's be clear with that. Secondly, 
by understanding is when you examine closely knit populations, highly, highly dense populations where millions of people are on top of each other, you would expect to find the same languages, but we often find a wide variety of languages in those spaces, which feels counterintuitive. But yes. I think yes. that one, yes, communication um, may have evolved into the language that we have now, and that language is a tool to help people cohabitate. But I think my understanding from an anthrop anthropological standpoint as well is that language solves the problem of intellectual property theft. So when you start to have populations on top of each other and then to commodify a skill or a trait that they have, they need to build a barrier between them and another group so that they're put in a disadvantage and can have an upper hand or somehow. Like, just like you don't give away your, like Amazon doesn't give away its shipping secrets, right? Right. No, so that's a way, like, so if I make, I'm, I'm being very like caveman, like basic right now, but like, no, I make. But this is still, it's rocks. a big idea that we're shrinking right now. So it's like, like ah. I make really good pointy rocks and everyone in the village likes my pointy rocks, right? And I want to get animal hides for that, right? No, you want to have <laughs> the sexiest woman. Okay, something that like one. that, right? You're, so you, I'm not gonna you make the best pointy rocks, you bring home the best dinners, you get the you get to have the most offspring, you get to have because you pick the most fertile woman. Like I mean, it's like the rules apply. <laughs> right. So if I if me and my clan or my friends, sorry, that's my son, um speak a language and we don't want you and your friends to get our secrets, I'm going to make words or change up what I'm saying to hide that information from you. So while languages can bring us together by, sh by learning each other's language or pidgins, which is like a whole other thing. Right. But also are um, a sociological barrier that separates people. So, and then you can look at a country like Russia, right? This giant landmass that's kind of sporadically populated with people who all share a language. Well, guess what? They have to commute, they have to cooperate with each other because otherwise they're going to have no way to like get across or like all these things. So like, it's kind of weird. Like it, it does both things. And then you get this like weird. Can music be considered a kind of language since it can communicate emotional ideas as opposed to verbal and be notated? It's a fantastic question. Um, I would say that, that music is not language, but it is communication. I agree. I, I, I concur with that. But I, but I will say that notes, I, notes. I was going to say notes is considered a language rule with rules and yes. can be language. However, that type of writing does not convey the emotional message that the music itself does. So right. you end up with two different diagnoses when it comes to music. You have the written, uh, uh, the written sheets. Uh, of music which does correlate the same message and because of the rules and the symbols can be read universally despite because it's it's its own length right Ooh, it I is it, no that would be a language though but well okay i'm gonna say emotion this. no but the music itself not just sheet music so sheet music could be a language but music itself is a communication i, I feel yes, like yes, this, absolutely. this topic music, is okay. going to get us into okay. a lot of treble you know? I'm sorry. What? I feel. I feel like this. This topic is gonna get us into trouble. Ha. <laughs> you know. Okay. I think music is communication 100. percent I think sheet music toes the line <laughs> between what makes it a language and what hey, makes Derek. it because I would say that. Appreciate oh, the love, hey, brother. Thanks, really decision. Hi. Um, keep waking people up. We're going to wake wild, people up with language today. Wild music Make some noise. is a finite system that can be co combined in an infinite number of ways. It doesn't possess the ability to talk about anything outside of what it actually is. So it doesn't communicate things about the past or the future. <laughs> right? It's only talking about one thing. It's giving uh, you an instruction on how to play. It's right. It's an instruction. It is. It's the. It's a manual. Right. It, there's no. Um, oh, here's here's where it gets funky. If you give the same sheet music to two different 
let's say cellists. You give one cellist the sheet music and an exact identical hey, copy to another cellist. You will, hey, Dustin, um, you will have, as a result, two pieces of music that sound similar, but are not conveying the same emotional stance. Just because like you can say something, artist, a different tone of voice. Right. Well, yeah, one yeah. one might be robotic and just follow the rules of the page, while another will interpretively, uh, will, like, will interpret the music in their own way. They might make it faster and like speedy and happy, and the other one might slow it down and and keep it keep it mellow. But it could be the same notes at the same time scale, but you end up with two different ways of communicating the same <laughs> language on the it, same piece of paper. It, it happens. All... It happens alto often. <laughs> Fucking a! Just, there's so many goddamn puns right now. <laughs> I, ju I just got a trouble joke, by the way. Took me like, yeah, about. the you trouble. So you that? should have seen. Uh, who was it that fucking said? Um, I'll take a note of that, Captain oh. Dad Bull. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I tried to on, play the piano one summer. Turned on the air, and that's when the sheets hit the fan. <laughs> My goodness, it's okay. Um, Hello. This is, the is okay. actually relevant to human language because there are languages that, well, our language has um, syllabic stress, so words have syllables, and if you no. change the stress on the syllable, it can change the meaning of the word, <laughs> and then you have languages with tonal aspect. Which, I was going to say like Chinese, which has yes. the eh, 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 right. eh. eh. Actually, my, my most viral video on TikTok is a bunch of linguists arguing in the Talking comments section about you, how right? I use the International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, <laughs> because there's two symbols for like a schwa sound, which is like uh. Yeah. And in American English, which is the language that the song was in, that I was dictating, um, there is no acoustical or articulatory difference between um, these two symbols. So one is used to demarcate a stressed syllable, and one is used to demarcate an unstressed syllable. But in monosyllabic words, so go, do, hot, one syllable. I don't need to demarcate stress because there's only one syllable that can have stress, which is the that's one that's awesome. So people were arguing in the comments, and I was like, look, IPA is a tool. This is how I use it. This is how I did it in grad school. I graduated. So, you know, I, again, we're, we're, we're trying to prescribe correctness to something that doesn't really possess correctness. And that's why I have an issue with linguistic prescriptivism outside of the preservation of marginalized groups trying to protect their intellectual property. So, and yeah, that's just it is, is, is there, is there a reason? Mm, okay, hold on. I got to phrase this properly. Otherwise that could come out as a different question. Just say it. It's a safe space. We'll. Uh, uh, no, I know it's a safe space. It's, we'll, it's... we'll do damage control later. Hi, Arch. Okay, hey, so. Arch. Hi. Okay, so let me let me try it. Um, if we assumed humans were altruistic, they then what would be the purpose of hiding information and having to have a different language? Do you know what I'm? Do you know where I'm going with this? Possibly? Yes. Okay. Yes, I understand. That's that's. Uh, mm, I want to hear you. You, you. you talk about that. Well, what, what is your question? Well, oh, if no. humans were altruistic, then would... Oh, just you. Everyone's would frozen. Would different languages in a similar space actually be a necessity? There we go. Okay. We're, we're fine. So now we're getting biblical. <laughs> a little bit. Just, just, just I, I, I missed that. I'm sorry. What if, okay, so what she was saying earlier is that in cities where there's a mass of people, we would assume, we should assume, at least statistically speaking, if we were just robots, everybody should speak the same language. However, they don't. And the reason why is because everybody has little secrets that they try to hide to keep themselves like on an economics way or, or in a cultural way above. Uh, or one step of ahead of competition um, in some way or another along those lines. Whether it's for tradition, whether it's for money, it doesn't matter. Their motives are, despite motives, it's, 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 it's the same. It's, we end up with a lot of languages in a small space, 
rather than one language in a small space and lots of languages in a huge space. So that being said, if humans were altruistic, if all people were open, not secretive, and actually gave a shit about everyone else, would there be a need for more than one language? So I don't think so because so, the, so you can go oh, in just, a direction with this. Ricky I think just had an aha moment. moment. I think you're trying to. T- I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think from a, a sciency evolutionary standpoint, I think you can run with that. I'm just say in general, not. I think you can yeah. run with that and say, oh, God, oh, like there's there's so many specifics that are throw out the window. People aren't altruistic. They're animals. Right. And they're out for their own best interests. And by right. crafting a system that can create barriers between tribes or groups or acts, yes. whatever you want to call them, that would make sense from an evolutionary standpoint of language. That's exactly where my mind went. Right. If we, because so we're a tribalistic. Why we to resolve that by saying we were all cooperative. We got all together to build this you know, tower to like go go get God, right? And God was like, oh, no, yeah. no, 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 and that was what the outcome of that was. And I want to make sure I oh, there's a really, really great comment. Um before I forget. It says, What do you think of new word generation via algorithm avoidance slang? For example, unalive becoming more frequently used word now, like it's part of my vocabulary now. Yes. And yes. that's exactly what was happening in these groups in antiquity. For different reasons. I don't know if you were here for the intro um, before you actually got online. Um, I talked about how Richard Dawkins uses the term meme as an idea and how we kind of see the word meme now the way that people would have used the word cult back then. So cult was to demonstrate an idea, right? And then like follow that idea. Meme Mm -hmm. is an idea that you interpret and sometimes follow as well. Mm -hmm. Everybody sees it differently but at the same time, it's still conveying a similar idea. Right. So like, but there's what, two, 3000 years of a difference within those two words. And now we see cult as a bad word. Like, oh God, that means something bad's happening. Right. And a meme is like, ha, ah, that's funny. That's just an idea. Like it's, we, we joke about memes all the time. Right. So, and yeah, anyway, we were talking about that at the beginning and that's kind of how I was like, so we're going to bring someone in to like explain how words change meaning within a person's language Mm -hmm. but then i also want to go all the way back to the beginning eventually and talk about the earliest form of communications and all of that but we'll get there (laughs) so yeah sure I, i agree i think i think there's two different things happening in the kind of the history of language that we can observe they don't cooperate with one another and it's a little confusing because we've got examples of human beings trying to communicate with each other and cooperating. And that's where you get like mixtures of languages and pidgins is the technical word for that P-I-D-G-I-N-S. Um, but you also have, you know, tons of different dialects and stuff that arise right. out of, you know, also geographic isolation. I don't want to make it sound like that's the only thing that triggers um, changes in language. You also oh, have, no. The islands. Isolation, you know. Oh, yeah. The island thing. That's fun. So the yeah. island no, 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 no. We don't need that no. song. And not this, that this one? Is a safe That's space. not what we're no, talking no about? Oh, okay. No, no. Right, sorry. My bad. My bad. <laughs> um, Where do trending cartoon spouse filters fit into God's plan for our lives? What is a trending cartoon spouse filter? I, I have don't no know idea that what that means. I don't think I, I understand that one. Arch, I feel like you're making a really sophisticated joke and I'm missing what it yeah, is. Yeah, I'm like out. Same. Same. Trendy. So I, I guess we can go back to what we were talking about before you joined, Imus. Is um someone asked me what was uh <clears throat> excuse me. I was live last week and someone asked me, Do you consider Christianity a cult? Mm-hmm. And I was like <sighs> The problem is, by the strictest adherence to the definition of cult, yes, but the definition of the word cult is very, very broad. It's very ambiguous. Uh, Our understanding of the word cult today is much more specific. When we think of cult, we think of like the Haley's Comet cult, um, certain sects of Christianity, Mormonism, 
uh, any sort of systematic belief that isolates you from the outside world and mm -hmm. dictates every aspect of your life. Like th that's what a cult is today. But in antiquity, that wasn't really how it was understood. Sure. It, it was it, it, pretty much everybody was a member of a cult in, you know, 2000, 1000 years ago. Uh, being a member of a cult was normal back then. Uh, but today it's, it's much more, it's different. So when they say like Christianity is cult, it, it is a cult. It's like technically yes, but it's not the same thing as being in like, yeah, the, the Haley's comic cult. It's it's not the same thing. So let me uh, ask you, based but, on like what you understand to be a cult and how you are sort of describing like its change in definition in antiquity, being part of a cult would potentially, depending on what kind of cult it was, increase your likelihood to survive. Yes. Ah, ah that's exactly right. Oh, okay. That's not the case now. Depending it's on the where same way in fucking prison. By oh, the way. no. It, but it's not the case now. But going, yet in going. some, it is. Right. In order, right. there are some cults, there are some systematic cults that can't i have i have to add systematic because if their idea behind their cult is not sustained through reproduction and the continuation of that idea right. and that system then it will be lost i am specifically talking about mormonism right now but i really think there's a lot more out there besides that one <laughs> Oh, so yeah. I mean, let's examine the religiosity of countries yes. that whose culture and survival hinge on your adherence to cult behaviors. Oh. Let's oh, not yeah. be specific about them because I don't want to be yeah. prejudiced prejudicial. Right, no, no. I, I, I realize I name dropped Mormonism, but that was just like No, that's fine. Mormon I just don't, I just don't want to call out any specific groups because I also don't want to No, no, I'm with you there. Down there. Um, if there's a country out there that uses their religion as a like as a system of government as well as their own yes. personal culture. Yes, there are that's, that's what I'm saying. And but, 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 let me just say this before we go any further. My, my, the point I was trying to make is someone who considers themselves a Christian who goes to church every Sunday and that's it. That's not the same thing as being a member of the Haley's comic cult. It, it's right. not the same thing. They can both technically be considered a cult, but it's not the same thing. You know, I feel like cult has this negative connotation to it. That's almost like My, hey, today you, it you, does, you bet but it me. didn't used to. Right. I feel it like used it to be totally that. normal. That's why I'm not really on the gravy train of like, anti-theism because i feel like it creates an idea that everyone who believes in a de deity concept has been hoodwinked they've been tricked ooh, um ooh, which while well, we may feel that way or some of us may feel that way i think being i think being vehemently anti-theist is the same thing as being vehemently a religion i i'm <laughs> with you there i actually think that theology oh we lost. Did we lose her? Oh, she just turned off the camera. Um, theology is needed for some people. Um, in some cultures, the idea of a moral standing or the idea of being a cooperative member of the culture or of the society sometimes means that they have to start out with a baseline of a few rules that they can follow that also interpret an idea of what being a good person makes or what it means. Um, that being said though, I, I like theology as a teaching tool. I do not like adults having theology as a baseline for their entire life's existence. That seems unhealthy. For you. For me, no, yeah, and this is, this is for me. So, that, that being said, I think most adults, if taught to critically think or to think critically beyond just the stories and the lessons that they were told as kids, they can still believe in the theology without being, oh, I don't want to use that word, 
Um, I was going to use the word addicted, but that's not that's not the word I want to say. Um, reliant on it. No, no, no. Reliant on it. Um, not addicted. I'm listening. I'm just turning the camera off because my son came into view and I don't like to put him on the internet. No, I, I appreciate that. No, that's, that's good. Um, no, I... The, the word I was looking for is is reliant. I don't want an adult to be reliant on a children's story that was supposed to teach them a lesson from back in the day as a way to completely live their life now as an adult. I think that it can be... Uh, but what, what I struggle with is... And I, I, I don't want this to sound the way it's definitely going to sound. Uh some adults have not matured past their childhood way of thinking you know what i mean like yeah. like they're full grown ass adults who still think like a child and to them uh they go through struggles in their life and they think that a god or a religious belief system delivered them from that and it's helped them recover like okay that's fine. Great. If that's helped you, great. Good. Go for it. If I'm, it's I'm not causing I, you pain, though. Yeah, like, I'm not going to argue with you. Go for there it. There needs to be an intervention somewhere. Yeah. <sighs> okay. But it's like if if you found if if a religious belief system or a belief in a god has has guided you to overcoming an addiction or overcoming some sort of trauma in your past and and that that does it for you go for it Great. as long as you don't turn around and say hey by the way you all need to do what i do everybody like as long as you don't do that you can have your belief to yourself i'm not gonna fight you go for it uh it's helped you i'm not gonna argue uh but it's as soon as you start saying hey god helped me overcome my addiction to heroin and by the way because of that you can't be gay anymore <laughs> that's when i'm gonna yeah. be like all right that's now we're, now we're gonna fight there's, Fuck. there's now a we're line gonna fight. there you know <laughs> there, there's a line so i i, I agree that i don't think anyone should be you know your religion does not mean my religion <laughs> um my I, i'm kind of interested i want to ask both of you both kind of used like words that somehow um, scriptural stories, whether they be from the Bible or other traditions, are like a child or it's for children. Mm. Yes, uh, I'm not. Uh, can you clarify what you mean by that? Um, children. Uh, fables Wait. and fairy Wait. tales and mother goose uh rhymes and biblical stories are all or or just origin stories are all taught to people in all cultures now not like literally what i'm saying but like there are stories or or uh, uh no no there's there's stories and lessons that are taught to kids as they grow older to prevent them from hurting themselves to prevent them from um being hurt to let them know how the world works like help them grow up basically. Um, but the concept of a child growing into adulthood and believing those stories to be absolute truth is problematic. So and I understand the fables and things, but I, I'm struggling to identify a particular tale in the Bible that is- Fucking Noah's Ark appropriate for children don't sin. And, oh yeah no none of them are appropriate for children doesn't mean they well, don't use them i had a children's bible i had some fucked up goddamn stories that i looked at they're not appropriate they not okay but they they frame it in a way to make it appropriate so like yeah. you have like children's bible comic books that they give you at sunday sure, school i had a children's bible and they have bright colored comic books like Noah's Ark you know you have so, all these birds and animals that are delivered from this flood and there's bright colors and, and every, everything's happy and good yeah. so they frame it in a way that's positive right you know, they, well, don't, they don't I tell know, you I, the part I, I where God about... is causing the death and destruction of no I read about Cain and Abel 
and I, I read about how Cain killed Abel. But what yeah. we learn from that is that God really loves you and that um, Cain, Cain might have sinned, but he's he's OK. Like, I mean, like literally it framed it in a way that Cain committed murder and it's OK. <laughs> I think I'm just ha I understand what you're saying, but I think even with secular information, we do this like rainbow cutesy loose. Oh no, I agree. Like, and that's all information for children. That's okay. I mean it's it. just but this might just be a, a, a as okay. in all things, not necessarily Hold just on that. Let me let me let me, finish. I want to hear what she's let saying. me think like I'm trying to think of like a, a books that my son has, right? That talk about things no one really like as adult adults care about, right? So like the pandas, what they did, he has this book that's pandas and like, it has like the one page is fuzzy, he does a bamboo page, you can feel the bamboo. And yeah. it's like, the panda did this, the panda's mommy lifted the panda. There's no, there's no really plot or anything like that, but it's cute and it has texture and he likes it, right? Right. But that has no meaning as an adult. So we right. can take a bit, we can take scripture and water it down and make it rainbow and kawaii or whatever <laughs> and for children. But at the end of the day, the actual information is something that is powerful and meaningful for adults. So I'm just, I'm having, I guess I'm struggling with the idea of framing that somehow scripture is designed for children. Cause I, I don't, I don't think it is. It, it's I, not designed for children, no. but it's conveyed a certain way to appeal to children. I um, actually I, think Okay. How is that different from what we do with secular information? I think that's it's not. Okay. It's not okay. at all. It's the exact same shit. Okay. Like it, it's like the Bible was not written to appeal to children. No, it, it was written to explain. The, okay, so fuck. The Old Testament I, is no, is basically a a tribe ex, creating their own origin story. In a nutshell, that's what the Old Testament is. It's a very small tribe who wound up on top, who was able to create their own origin story and say, oh, cool, we can make up whatever we want about history. So we came from this big, dark shit that happened in our past and all this. So they were able to create their own origin story, right? That's that's why the Old Testament was written. So when you have children, and it, we have Sunday school, and we're trying to teach children that these things, that they have to try to like, make it appeal to i don't even know what i'm fucking trying to say no it was not um, written for children but they tried to make it appeal to children by ignoring the fact that god committed genocide right ignore that don't don't even pay attention to that what's important is god made a boat right that all the, the the animals survived and the people survived there was this horrible thing but god provided a way for everything to survive that it's 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 hope like that's that's how they frame it um, i have i think i have a uh <laughs> another example that's not biblical in nature okay um greek mythology okay i i'm i'm just trying to think one of the stories um fucking hercules let's do hercules okay, okay. The story of Hercules. Hercules, it doesn't matter that Zeus fucking raped his mom and, and now he's pregnant. Like now she's pregnant, has Hercules, right? Um, the 10 trials of Hercules, 12 trials? 10, tri 10 trials of Hercules. <laughs> at, what? I said, I don't remember. It's been I, I'm trying to remember, but um, the 10 trials were done as a act of jealousy or anger towards Hercules because this one dude that that ruled this land was like you ain't no son of a god prove yourself blah blah so he gives them these 10 trials and of course hercules like wins all the trials um with the help of some gods and with the help of of, of friends and everything and the whole point is that hercules might be mighty but he still needed help along the way and that was that's like the storyline that's where it goes now, it might be violent, and there might be, like, some goddamn terrifying concepts of monsters in there, but the point isn't that that was, like, more of a entertainment value to keep people interested, but the lessons learned from Greek mythology are day-to-day -day lessons that are used in society, and Romans and the Greeks knew this, and they would teach it to their kids, and even if they did worship certain gods as if they, like that they existed 
they didn't they they understood that the stories had happened previously they understood that those were stories that the gods helped them tell so that they know not to do the things that the gods did because they were at fault and the gods learn from this so we should learn from it too like okay. it's it's that kind of example like it's like a follow by example type thing okay. but at the same time i mean there's some really really fucked up mythology <laughs> so like the whole thing with medusa or arachna oh my god the arachna one is so bad um i don't know if you know that one at all but that one's basically there was a weaver that was this amazing this daughter that like could weave anything into silks and athena came down and she's like patron goddess of weaving she comes down and challenges her and fucking weaver girl is like here's my thing and athena got pissed and turned her into a goddamn spider and that's why we have spiders oh arachnophobia got it. arachna yeah and um yeah, but like but athena apologized and said well i realize i made you a spider but here, let me uh, give you the ability to continue weaving because you're obviously very good at it. Uh, <laughs> and that's why spiders have webs. So it's an example. Okay. Like, okay. There's, I think that, so every culture has origin stories and lesson stories. Sure. The only ones I know of that people talk about and actually follow as lessons as adults today are passages from the Bible. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's, that's what I'm alluding to is because okay. I see those origin stories in these different cultures as lessons. And anytime when I was a kid, I would ask about the Bible. They're like, they're lessons to be learned. I'm like, great. But then I get quoted shit from like a 60 year old man who's like, yeah, but what's his face? Couldn't like, they couldn't fight between the chids, so they cut them in half and gave them to both both moms. And yeah. and I was I'm just like, and what the fuck is that supposed to do with my life? Like I don't understand. Like he's like, just make a decision. I think you're trying to to assert the king's wisdom, knowing that if he were to posture to do that, that one of the women would confess out of panic and grief. Yeah, I think that's the story on First Samuel. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that's the the two ladies. One wants a son, the other has the son. And yeah, King yeah. Solomon says, "You know what? I have a solution. Let's just cut the baby in two. Mm -hmm. And, and one like the one real mom's says, like, no, yes, no, don't touch it. Cut the baby in two. That that'll. T and the other woman's like, no, don't cut my baby in two. Just give it to her as long as the baby will survive. And, and that's, that's how, how I knew who the real the mom was. Wise king was like, oh, okay, so. That was easy. I know who the true mother is. Right. I think that was the function of that. Um, yeah, that's I. It's been years. I was. Just, oh, no, I just. I know more about Greek mythology <laughs> and Nordic <laughs> mythology and Celtic mythology now than I know about biblical mythology. Yeah, so, I'm not that, sure. that story though took place during a famine, so and that was a point where like a, a donkey's head would sell for like three hundred shekels of silver. I think. Good lord. They because meat was very, very expensive, very, very rare. Again, they were in a famine. So when the king said, "Yeah, let's let's kill the child and eat it," like that was normal, at right? Because the they were fulfilling that prophecy. That there will come an age when it, the desperation is so great, you will eat your own children, and that literally yes, very good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that thing. That was a thing. <laughs> a prophecy. That was a thing. Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, someone commented, deities are just human archetypes. No external power, only placebo. That's a bold claim. What's your evidence for that? Um, so I, I, I don't, uh, I don't disagree, but it is a bold claim and I do want evidence. So I, I'd like to point out that. I can't find that one. The fall, it was from 10 PM. So it's a little bit old. From 10 Bitter Shins, I think is the name of Oh, Winter Sitzel? Wiener schnitz. Wiener schnitz. Wiener Wiener schnitz. Are you are you causing shit? Yes. There it is. Always. Deities are just human archetypes, no external power, only placebo. So I think it's important for us to talk about the evolutionary advantageousness of uh, false positives. Because that's sort of where the I think spirituality can be explained through like an evolutionary scientific lens. So if you're in the woods and you're like, what's that? Right? 
you're more likely to survive off of the basis that there was something there that it that could get you. Yeah, it's like then oh, you were a scary you. noise. I remember this one time my granny said if I heard a scary noise, it's a bear and I should run and therefore mm, survival. Let's go. <laughs> so the people who more more often exhibit this this false positivity are more likely to survive and then pass those traits on to their offspring. If you just go, oh, that was nothing or whatever, and it is a bear, and it gets you, you're not going to live, right? So I think it, it's possible that over time that ha- that turns into spirituality. There's a ghost that's going to get me. There's a demon that's going to get me. There's a god that's going to get me. And that okay. is where it came from. I agree with you. But I also want to discuss the concept of instinct and how things right. scare people even without having any stories told. Like if you heard a noise in the dark room and you didn't have an identifier you mean, to go with it. Do you mean purely carnal instinct or instinct yeah. that is influenced by uh it's a reactionary instinct. It's the it's the fight or flight response. But I'm discussing. But so, how do you how do you separate that from so if if you grow up and you if you grow up in an atmosphere that teaches that there are bears or ghosts or something and you hear a sudden noise how, how are you naturally going to be like that's a ghost or a bear or are you going to come to that conclusion based off of what you were taught by your parents so, or, this is the nature versus nurture subject and it gets really tricky um, oh i know i know it does <laughs> I don't remember what study it was, but there was a study of, I want to say during the Holocaust, and I'm going to very cautiously say that because I don't know. That's very, very likely. It's very possible because there's a lot of psychological studies done. Come at me. That's very likely. It's very likely. Um, But I do know I read of a study where they took some toddlers. Say what? Artist comment is so funny. If you want to like highlight. Yeah, the donkey's head thing was only second. King's. Scathing Aces in Bible Peace Theater is doing it recently. <laughs> That's funny. Oh. <laughs> he wanted that ash. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Dead ass. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so there was a study done where they took toddlers and they gave them, they put them in separate rooms. And one was fed via pushing a bowl towards them, like under a table. Like they were given like no physical anything but like no one ever went in their room with them while they were like awake and aware of anything uh i and remember the study yeah you might have i know, I know exactly what you're talking about yeah keep going yeah and then they also did one where the kid was like you know held constantly and like never yeah. fucking put down and then they and had they, kids that were like kind of in between back and forth but of they, course like they learned know, that the the pituitary gland is stimulated by touch directly right. So right. it grows so, only by a physical touch. Well, it didn't, they didn't, it's not just that that they learned, but there were some obser- uh, observations that would occur via that, which is um, the kid that was all by himself didn't get scared easily. He was just, okay, this is how life is. Like he just, he, there was nothing to tell him otherwise. The kid that was held constantly, however, as if he was put down, fear just immediately like there was immense chaos and pain and fear and everything was wrong and this is where like it's that's like a nurturing situation right so like even though that kid was never touched it's because of the situation the 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 stimuli that he was uh uh uh, tested with uh was absent and it it still caused a reaction. Um, now, if we were to look at bonobos, or if we were to look at, mm, if we were to look at deer, and I'm, uh, it's just just any animal. If they, if like, without without having necessarily a form of language, but also but also being able to communicate, they know that like oh, a sound is terrifying. Oh, bonobos know how to communicate. Yeah, but no, I, that's why I was like bonobos, and I'm like, mm, that's not a good one. And I was gonna say chimps, and I'm like, mm, that's not a good one either. And I was like, they almost communicate, but they don't have language. Right. Let's just do, let's do something simple. I was like a deer, but there's still a lot of scenarios where the deer would have some intrinsic understanding of what's going on. So, um, 
yeah that's it's so kind of it, this is this is all hype a lot of this is hypothetical because it's nature versus nurture is a hard fucking subject so oh, now that you brought up the animals communication what, <laughs> what do you what is your own personal theory i guess of why human beings are the only species on the planet that have language it's because we were the first species to develop as a a social species no our, that's not really true like uh, our, our survival was dependent or we realized that our survival was dependent on um wolves developing yeah. some sort of community and mm. our ancestors were the mentality first. with wolves no thing. no horses no. same thing they herds are well, herds i don't are. agree with you but that that can be your hypothesis I mean, yeah, it could be. I just, I don't, I don't agree with that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm totally fine with being wrong. <laughs> I, well, I I don't have an answer. I'm just curious what you guys think about it. That's so sort of my, my position is that we don't have an answer for this. No, we, so we, we, when it comes to language, it's, when it comes to language, it gets tricky. When it comes to communication, there is so much more evidence of communication between animals that I, I, I just want to be like, it's because we have thumbs. Well, okay, so Opposable thumbs, bitches. Little fuckers. So I acknowledge the hypothesis that some anthropologists have that the first, the potentially, the first signs of human language, something that we considered something that evolved into language was through gesturing and sign. Like you think of the caveman, like pointing and grunting, right? Yeah. Right. And that was accessible and something that we could do because we're bipedals. We freed up our hands to be able to do these things, right? Right. And then you have like tool use and stuff. So instead of having to occupy our hands with this communication of this gestural system to communicate, we have now transferred the responsibility of the, that language system, whatever you want to call it, because you don't know what it looked like, right? You don't know if it's communication or language. Right. The mouth and facial expression, so we can do the communication and we can do the language while utilizing tools simultaneously. So it's like these two degrees of, of uh, a positive outcome from bipedalism. However, you would know more about like the timing of this, but we don't really find examples of symbol use, arbitrary symbol use, past like 90 to 100,000 years ago. You yes. have art that predates that, certainly. I acknowledge that. But we don't. We go from, this is the, this is the thing, right? This so is where we get, it goes from pictures. Can come from nothing, right? That's what everyone always argues about online, right? Right. But we go from no arbitrary symbol use to a complete complex written system of language. Like, it's yes. like that. So what happened? Right. Something happened. I don't know if it's a god. I don't know if it's aliens. But I don't know if there's something evolutionary that happened. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Well, so we're snapping our fingers, but it, to those of those that are listening to us, a snap of our fingers is not like, oh yes, instantaneous. It looks instantaneous on an archaeological record. Right. But what is missing is about a thousand years worth of data. Sure. Right. It, all the way up to 10,000 years worth of data. I mean, there's there's a huge gap there. But that's just it, is there's no slow development of the language. It's just, we had pictures getting drawn on caves. We had some symbols on caves communicating concepts. Not necessarily a language, but like, right. you know, being able to say, go to this hill, find buffalo. Like, it's it's something like that. And then suddenly, bam, we have a tablet. We have fucking Rosetta Stone going on over here. Like it's, it's, it is instantaneous in the archeological ref record, but with the understanding that there's a few thousand years of gap information just missing, which is okay. where- I don't it, it only seems yeah. instantaneous. Yes, it only seems instantaneous. Because there's but a gap then, in our when, knowledge. Like, okay, when when I snap my fingers and say, and just like that, like, and just like that, the dinosaurs showed up. People are like, oh, wow, so it happened really fast. I'm like, yeah, a few million years. That's like no time at all. To me, because I think that way. I think in a geologic time scale. 
So to say like, oh yes, the humans showed up. I'm very, we haven't been here long enough for me to be like, ah, oh, yes, geologically speaking, people have caused some interest. I mean, there are some interesting effects of our existence, but at the same time, we have been here for less than a blink of an eye. Overall. Yeah. That is so, very accurate. We are, we're a very young species in the grand no scheme of things. We have not been here very long. No, no, not at all. Ants have a pretty complex pheromone language. So that's not language. I would say that's that ants have, ants have a complex communication system that is driven by pheromones. Um, but that oh, is yeah. automatic, repetitive, and doesn't uh, exhibit the ability to infinitely talk about things outside of like survival level stuff. Can I... Can I discuss something beyond that in, in that? Sure. I'm just going to head to the comments. I'm a little behind. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So, um, yeah, have, have at it in the comments. I, I have, I have two things. I'm going to give you two examples of, uh, of a practiced, a practiced instinctual baseline of like an animal trying to find a mate or an animal trying to, um, reproduce. And I'm also going to give you another animal trying to reproduce, but it's done via like pure instinct, no, like no understanding whatsoever. They do it because it's just, it's something you do. Okay. Um, one of those is a, uh, there's this, there's a, a, a cicada eater. So there's cicada eaters, which are like wasps kind of, um, when they lay uh, oh, yeah. larva. They will go and get a cicada or they'll go like get a massive fucking caterpillar and they'll put it in the ground and they'll have a little hole in the ground and they have, and they've watched these things do, do this and uh, it'll fly away and go get a bug and come back and it will do like a little dance around its little hole to make sure like that's its hole. Okay. And then it will take the thing and it'll shove it inside. And then once it's inside, it'll like co close it up and then it will fly away and it'll come hey, back Jimmy. and do the same thing again. Hi, Jimmy. So that being said, they took a few little uh, things, stimuli, little like a, a rock and like a leaf and like a stick and moved him over like to the other side of where his hole was. As soon as he finished building his hole and like left to go get something, they, they fucked with him basically. They just moved shit over and he flew back, didn't recognize the location, decided to start from scratch again, start digging out his hole set it up, do his little dance, go and get a thing. And as soon as he left, like they moved it again and he couldn't fucking like, he had to go back, do the dance and then go get the thing. Right. Like he had to do the dance, always had to do the dance. Um, and now like, we're into a very complex topic of where cognition and language begin and end. Which yes. Is so that's, that's where I was going with this. So then we, we get to, <laughs> so I, I, hold on. I, I feel like we've, we ventured off pretty far from the main topic um and i want to try and we, we only have like 30 minutes left of the show so i, I want to try and like you. maybe get back to the uh original subject because like this has been fucking awesome and fascinating there is uh, so much to talk about but it's been okay. all over the place and the, the reason for that is because this is the the nature of linguistics is it topic. is all over the place it's a fucking spider web like okay, you can't okay stay on one topic when you talk about linguistics it's, so, it's everywhere i must so i want to as best as we can try and maybe come back to one centralized subject okay for the rest um, of the time I, I don't know even what i'm asking right now <laughs> so Sorry. i must can we can we go back to the uh the snap and there's and there's now uh, uh language Sure. So, I mean, like you said, there maybe is just missing items in the record right. that we haven't discovered yet. And I'm fully open to that idea. Um, but I think the fact that there's some people arguing with me in the comments and you're entitled to your opinion, but I would like the people who in the comments who are saying that we're not the only species that has language, I'd like for you to provide me with evidence that there are animals that show use of symbols other evidence species, and uh, a source i know yeah, it is source that, that there are other species that have um symbolic systems uh, i would love to see that that would be very interesting um, so one of the things that archaeologists have been able to do 
but it isn't fully recognized within the linguistics or the, I guess, paleolinguistic community is the concept of physical, and I don't necessarily mean, it could be sounds, but physical manipulation of body parts in a way to convey a message within that culture. Right. Um, I think the, uh, fuck, one of the things I can think of is nodding your head yes and saying okay. no. Okay. That is almost universally dominant as far as a concept. Almost, but it's almost. not. Almost, but it's not. And it's the same thing as like thumbs up and thumbs down. Right. Right. Um, these it's, are it's things not... that we can trace. We can trace contact between peoples back to a potential origin spot or area. <laughs> Uh, and like, oh, yes, this was the first group of people to do this. And now it's everywhere type of thing. Talking about talking. So meta. I know, right? It's fucking it's fucking incredible, though. Like, I mean, meta as fuck. This is is, is fucking amazing. Well, no, meta but, AF. but what I want to get into, I really I wanted to talk on this, this is 30 minutes. And, and I know this is going to open a can of worms. But what I want to talk about is the commonality of how certain languages use based off of the relevance of a cultural understanding there is a set of words that might be used more or less based like within that language or within that culture so the the best one i can think of right now is money in english money okay. is used as money bucks dollars clams uh, um, like synonyms like yeah, there it's it's synonyms, but there's yeah, like synonyms. hundreds of them just to describe money, right? Because money is a predominant factor in our language, in our society, in how we function. Um, in I'm I'm going with what I know. In Maori culture, they use the term Maori as a symbolic spiritual essence that can be in something as well as a behavioral thing that someone could be portraying. Okay. So you could say something is Maori, which means like it's it's like it's holding strong, it's doing it's doing great, it's doing what it needs to. Or like um like you feel Maori, which means like you know you're hyped up, you're ready to go. Um but they'll use that same word meaning a vast number of things in in a different like in different ways. So I wanted to kind of talk about commonality in languages to describe importance of culture okay so a couple things yeah. one um the hand gestures and the nodding that we talked about is communication and not language sorry yes i that's yes. what i meant that's, that's what okay. I meant. I'm clear about that. What I meant. i'm with you i'm sorry okay. I, no, I, don't I, be sorry don't be sorry no um, i was i was so fucking i was trying to yeah, get okay. I, just want, so much I forgot don't you know, listen to her you should be sorry right? I you have a goddamn sorry. sticky note to make no, sure no, I no. use the right words. You okay? did a bad thing. I just want the listeners to to, to not complain the two things. Um, the other thing is that <laughs> I want to point out something that also kind of toes the line of language and communication are onomatopoeias. So those are words that describe yeah. sounds, boom, crash, bang, things like that, right? Right. They so do it's not share true. commonality across human beings. The words oh, are yeah. so woof woof in Russian woof, is like half half. Like yeah, in French is like woof woof. Yeah, it's like it's, they, they don't they don't recognize each other at all. But we so are, do, are we hearing them differently? They're not right. acoustically or from a spectrographic standpoint different sounds, but we're demarcating them in completely different ways because our viewpoint of those sounds or our our, our linguistic bias to those sounds is represented by different things. And we have a huge problem with this. When we try to transliterate. So let's talk about the word transliteration. Oh so if God. you have a language yeah. that is using a writing system that doesn't uh communicate with your writing system you will write it out with your letters so if i'm trying to write like japanese uses three writing systems hiragana katakana and kanji i use latin like latin letters right so if i'm trying to write out a word in japanese i can do my very best to try to use the graphemes available to me to represent the phonemes in that sound so phonemes are sounds graphemes are letters okay oh but it's never going to fully represent those sounds unless I'm using the International Phonetic Alphabet. So there is a writing system 
that every single person on the planet has access to. You need to be trained in it. I, I had to get it as part of my master's degree that represents every single speech sound that exists on earth that we're aware of. It is probably the only example where linguistic prescriptivism reigns supreme because we can't change the function or meaning of any of those symbols because they represent all available sounds. Again, we're talking about a finite system that's used to create an infinite amount of information, computations, whatever. And that infin infiniteness and that finiteness has been proven mathematically. I'm not a mathematician, but we have things like Zip's Law and stuff that we can get into on another episode since we've got 20 minutes left. Oh, sure. But, yeah. <laughs> but common so, knowledge. You know, we just gotta be, really. like, it's interesting because things that we would consider like universal, when we look at how they're represented in languages, they they aren't, they don't line up. They, they, they come out differently for people. No, right. It's And the thing is, like, uh, using that system and then also having, like, a... Mm, uh, what am I, the, like an I, let's say an IPA for that language, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a picture to show the phonetic use of like. So there's, there's symbols. Yeah. There's so there's the symbols, symbols, but like for, for the layman, for the layman, there's this loveliness that you can get. I can't if Feel I can free to ask questions. There's, rawr. hold on. Um, so that's, that particular uh, picture is showing you some speech sounds and where they occur in the mouth. For, yeah, uh, let me look at that. For American English, that is. Yeah, it, it's, it's English IPA. Yeah, <laughs> um, that right one's there, American yeah. English IPA, but they can change. I find it really interesting. It, mm -hmm. it helped me learn French sure. by having the French IPA. And yeah. seeing seeing where those vowels and where those consonants lie according to um, where they went. Same thing with Maori. Um, mm -hmm. When I was learning bits and pieces of Polynesian and and uh, 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 South Pacific language, it was that's a whole other ball game. Let me tell you, I I still can't fucking speak it very well. I'm gonna say one more thing, and then we'll take the rest of the time to answer questions because yeah. I think we're gonna go down a rabbit hole. And we're gonna take a moment. yeah, yeah, we are. We we're gonna have to, to, we have to do a part two. That's what I'm. What's not, what I'm hearing is we have to do a part two that we have to hit on. I would love it. I'd be happy to do that. Um, oh, I just wow. want to take a moment to a acknowledge list here. All right. that several oh, wow. times, we did a list. several times during the last hour and a half, um, the three of us who are white Americans. <laughs> have been talking, have in, intermittently talked about the language and culture of other um, people who we're not a part of. Um, and we're talking about that through the lens of our education and That's our true. viewpoint. Um, and that ideally when we're talking about these cultures and these languages, they should be native speakers or people of those cultures. So if we got something incorrect- You're fine, don't worry. Um, or wrong, um, I just want to acknowledge that, like we're not speaking for, like we're not, we're not here talking about American English today. That would be probably the most appropriate thing, right? right. We're talking about all cultures all over the world through the lens of white Americans. I mean, I just want right, to right, right. quickly. No, this is this is our interpretation from our viewpoint. Right. And I, I would love to be corrected by yeah. a native, uh, by, by someone who has a more, uh, more solid standing in, right. in some of the cultures that we discussed. It's difficult. Um, I think for both of our, our professions, we're often talking about either groups of people who no longer exist, or we're talking about marginalized or very small groups who don't necessarily have a person to represent them. So it can be difficult to adequately talk about them that's, uh, that's in a way that's meaningful. Uh, I, I might know a few people. I know I know a I know a speech pathologist that lives in New Zealand, and I oh, might be able to talk chat. to someone. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah be really interesting if I can get them to yeah. would emojis to count as a universal language considering the mm. communal the communality and ubiquity of modern computers and the simplicity of the pictograms fantastic that's question. a really good question yeah. well no because emojis are yeah they're, they're pretty universally recognized right they, like, so my question to you is um the group so I can like kind of answer this question. Well, well, we'll get a consensus first. Um, does a smile mean the same thing in all cultures? I would say yes. Here's yeah. why. No. Because 
No. Well, what no. I would say is people they have tested blind people, people who were born blind. Mm. And when they would smile and they would indicate that was a sign of happiness. They didn't know they were smiling, but they were smiling. And so they were like, oh, this is there, a universal sign. There are certain that I acknowledge there are certainly outliers to this, but at least 70%, at least 60%. The majority. The majority. The majority. majority. Yeah. You kind know what a smile means, right? So yeah. to answer Dan's question, from my standpoint, I don't think emojis are language. But I do think emojis are the closest thing we have to a universal communication system where they're understood. However, what it's like really a representation is, of a language, right? Like what it what it is is you're taking things that we all experience and know about, or most of us. I shouldn't say all. I should never say that. Most of us who are engaged with emojis, who would be on a platform where we could use emojis, understand what these abstract pictogram versions of these things mean an eggplant a smiley face a zebra like they're just pictures so it's a communication system because it's evolved into this way that we can like talk with just emojis or whatever but it's not language but it does it does like you're, what you're saying it, it does it is ubiquitous it's the closest thing we have to like a shared international thing out of outside of ipa so wiener schnitz um he just said i heard french people find americans creepy for smiling so much I, I realize that you're just giving a comment, but this is where we're going right back to in Japan. They cover their mouth when they yes. smile. Mm -hmm. And there's two reasons that I understand they do this for. Okay. One is showing your mouth and open, like opening your mouth wide and, and, and showing the inside of your mouth is kind of considered gross. Okay. Uh, right. Because they didn't two, have very good oral hygiene. Yeah, well, that's the other one is, or two is if you have very good teeth, you are bragging by smiling openly. So you cover your mouth. It's My understanding had to do with like Buddhist remnants and how showing bone is like a bad. Yeah, like showing any. Yeah. Teeth or bones. yeah um, so I, I don't know if it answers your question fully. I want to make sure I've answered Dan's question uh, okay. fully, but I, I wouldn't consider it a language, but I would consider it as close as, as close to a universal commonality that we have right now, given the advent of social media and the constant inter, inter uh, what if change. can we call it without rules? Can we call it a systematic communication, but not necessarily a language? Yeah, it's definitely not a language. Yeah, I so think I, I'm, I like quarrel with the word systematic. You what? You have a problem with the word systematic? Yeah, like. Well, okay. Let me say it's a system of communication, not systematic form of communication. Okay, I, yeah, I can get behind that okay. maybe more. I can work with that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, and the other thing <laughs> is, that, yes, French French people find Americans creepy for smiling so much. Thank you for reminding me that my family finds me creepy because I smile as much as Yeah, I well, um, you know what? <laughs> Americans find French people creepy for saying we so much. You know? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> why is it always we? We this, we that. Like, that that's weird. Maybe so, yeah. put, like, a list of questions. You know? They're the weird I, ones. I, right? Yeah, that one's like crazy. At a guess, Tolkien's languages are usable and functional. So when would enough competent users come together to have the system be classified as a language? Um, I think that conlangs are languages. And if you have two people who can use that system to communicate effectively. It can be practiced. Right. It can be a language. There are people who communicate in like Klingon. Yeah. Oh my God. Did I, that did, is a I, whole I know, did you, oh have, did you hear me talk about that? I, that's gotta be months ago. I talked about it when my aunt and uncle want to talk about things in front of now, you know, my aunt and uncle, they, they speak a few languages. Um, but the one that they know that their kids and their grandkids do not speak is Klingon. I love so it. They will talk to each other in Klingon when their guests around. And when their kids are around, because nobody can fucking figure out what they're saying. Because no one's a Star Trekky like they are. Please take a video of it and send it to me. It would make my whole day. What differences, such as learning skills, might there be for with someone who form an early age becomes functional, fluent in multiple languages? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, there's there's a very interesting. Interesting. question. 
Um, yeah. bi bilingualism, so raising a child in an environment where they're constantly exposed to language does not cause language delay. Let me be very clear about that. That would be very um, xenophobic uh, beliefs yeah. among therapists as well. It, it can, it can identify a learning disability faster because of the way that someone learns, but that doesn't mean that it's a causation to it. Like for me, you could tell I was dyslexic because when it went from like writing in English to writing in French, things got backwards and went a little haywire. So it just, it was something that you could see language, right away. Right. And that's an area of learning French as a second language. Yeah. Right. I'm talking so about like, who from birth is exposed to two languages. Oh yeah. 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 No, no. It's so, um, so say uh, for example, um, at by two, we expect most, um, neurotypical people, and I say that very carefully, um, to have about 50 words by two years old. That's like the benchmark. That's like the average, okay? Based on their research, like about 90 years worth of research. Um, but if that child is growing up in a household where they're speaking, stick with the French. French is my second language, so I feel like they're comfortable spoken. Oh, I didn't realize that was your second language too. Okay. So I'm not fluent, but I know enough. Mm -hmm. I need to read and stuff. We can communicate. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. if you have 25 words in French and 25 words in English, that still meets the criteria because it's 50 words. Exactly it does, yeah. The other thing, too, you will find in bilingual children is that when they conflate, when they use both languages in the same sentence, the, the syntax um, keeps itself. So they don't, they don't mix up the two grammars, which is like, I mean, I can talk four hours about grammar, so we're not going to go down that road. Je in Francais. <laughs> Episode two. No, no, no. It's I was like so. You, Spoiler. I was trying to blend English and French. Je parle français pour peut-être treize ans. Treize ans? Yeah, treize ans. Treize ans. Yeah. Quand j'ai visité totally totally en France avec mon mari, j'étais en sang et je ne peux pas uh, manger uh, le fromage parce qu'il n'a pas pasta pizza. Pasta pizza. Okay, I feel like I heard something about a mouse. Okay. Just then, no, nothing about uh, a mouse. I said that about I a mouse. Like, really? Wow, I am rustier than I thought. About 13 okay. years, and yeah. I was when I visited France with my husband. I was pregnant with my son, and I couldn't eat any of the cheese because it wasn't pasteurized. That's what I said. I was gonna say, yeah, I I caught bits and pieces of that. Your accent is lovely. <laughs> Thank you. you. You do very nicely. It's it's been a while since I've. So my thing is like I I learned French at a time before I could read or write. Um, so I'm kind of, I have a little bit of illiteracy when it comes to French, but sure. I learned French before I learned English. Okay. I have a lot so, of illiteracy when it comes to French. Yeah. So it's, it's oh. kind of a little bass backwards for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's, <laughs> oh yeah. So like, yeah, using, you know, those anachronisms. Um, I've heard but, the Japanese but if I sit around the right people for a long enough amount of time, I will flip completely into French, and it's oh cool. Yeah, but it's, we'll have to do some French content. I've been finding some content creators that we can right? do some French content. It's tricky. Like, well, I don't know, but like, if I have to, my husband's gonna lose his shit. Oh no! <laughs> Sad enough. It's, uh... um, I've heard the Japanese language cannot do create puns, play on words, true or false. I don't know enough about Japanese to answer that question. However, I do want to make it clear that there are plenty of languages in the world that do not use number words, color words, directional words, and don't use the concept of yes and no. Um, a Gaelic would be a great example of that. So if you say, are you going to the store? You say, I'm not going to the store. There's a negation, but there's no no. It doesn't exist. Um, yeah, no yeah, also doesn't exist in Latin. Thing. So if you find any right. um, ecclesiastical writings that have no or yes in them, they're not translated correctly. So I, I wonder... This is just a side note, and I just want to be quick about it. Um, as a child, mm -hmm. when you were taught language, when you were doing grammar classes, English classes, reading classes, and you had to rephrase what was like the, you had to put a negative to the positive of a statement like that. It's like, are you going to the store? I am not going to the store. Instead of, are you going to the store? And you answered like, yes, and you get that wrong on your like homework. Right. Like, does anyone remember doing that? Um, I wonder... <sighs> I feel like I, how do I say this? I have, I had an opinion about it cause I fucking hated writing in general as a kid, but I did not mind rephrasing orally. It was just the handwriting part of it that pissed me off. Anyway, um, 
I wonder if it was because of the Latin understanding of having to rephrase a negative in order to understand the question or in order to un like to it. There's, there's a correlation in there. I, I, I don't know how to articulate it right now, but there's a correlation and we can talk about it some other time. I'm just poor sure. random thought process. Anyway, moving one on. My, one of my favorite examples of, of, of how language differentiates from one another is because I'm, I'm, I'm trained in classical Greek, right? Okay. Um, so when it comes to Greek, uh, when you use the word love, yes. right? There example. are three different words for love right. in Greek. There's right. agape, there's phileo, and there's eros, right? right. Agape there's... is the unconditional love. Phileo right. is a brotherly love. Uh, eros, obviously, where we get the word erotic, is a sexual love. Like in English, we use the word love to in encapsulate sort of all of those. But in mm -hmm. Greek, there's three different words, and, and they mean different things. It's kind of like how in um, an Eskimo or an Inuit, or I yeah, in, in in Eskimo language. Sorry, I'm fucking that let's, up. Let's sorry. use Inuit. Let's not use Eskimo. Inuit. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's they still have uh, yeah. they have like ten different words for snow. Like we yeah. we attach an adjective to the word snow, so we have a slushy snow, a watery snow, a well, fluffy the, snow, a powdery this, snow, a dry snow. Right. Well, this is what I was well, getting at. Them, they have English ten has... different words for the type of snow they're dealing with. Right. They don't attach an adjective to it. They have a separate word for each kind of snow. Right. Well, uh, that's the um, that's the connotation that. Well, that's that's kind of what I was trying to get to with the uh, in English. We have multiple different words for money because yeah. of the importance of it and the relevance of it within our society. Snow is relevant to those in uh, uh, the northern northern territories of the first the the First Nations people. It's 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 relevant up there. Uh, yeah. So they they needed a way to more quickly communicate the type of snow that they're dealing with right. when they're hunting or or whatever yeah you want to build an igloo, igloo you don't get the soft shit you get the hard shit so you go and get this shit yeah um <laughs> i'm not saying that that's incorrect i think the i just want to make sure everyone is understanding like Mommy. yes honey sorry <laughs> Feel free. Oh, she dropped a pan. Feel free to tell me I'm incorrect, by the way. I absolutely feel free. I was going to say, it's not necessarily a speedier way to have the language. It's it's an important thing within the culture. Yeah. I, I want to describe it a little bit differently than how you described it. Like, so we kind of have like similar different words for snow um like how we say like sleet or hail so it's kind of has the same function i just don't want people to think that like snow meaning one kind of snow has like 10 words for it okay let me let's rephrase it then um in hawaii like money like the example like they're two yeah. different things so like money example like yes all those words mean money and they don't really they're not like different yeah where they're synonyms where the different words for snow you're absolutely right that oh they describe different kinds of snow so they can communicate that because it's important to their culture, but the word doesn't just mean snow. It's like, right. Right. It's know, not on the ground, fresh snow, deep snow, frozen snow. Like right. it means, right. right. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say in, in we geology had actually adopted um, oh. some terminology for dried lava for cooled lava um, okay. off of Hawaiian words, because oh. we didn't have a separation for the understanding of it. Um, and it's not rock. necessarily a type of rock. It's quite literally how the lava cooled. Oh, and you right. can have very sharp, pointy uh, uh, lava that will cut right through your shoes. You don't want to walk on that shit. Like, you do not walk on it. That is called uh-uh. It is literally A line A. Uh-uh. Uh-uh? Like, no, no? Uh-uh. <laughs> uh -uh. Bad. You don't walk on that. Rounds, that but <laughs> but if you come across nice flowing uh, uh, lava that is cooled in a very, very bubbly and, and, and expansive way, that is called pohohoi. 
Oh, okay, cool. I didn't so know. So you that. end up with a uh, uh, or pohoihoi. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a crystallizing difference in them, which is really cool, Ooh. mineralogically speaking. But adopting the language of, like, we had never come to a barrier where, how do you describe this rock differently from that rock? Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, a goddamn Polynesian uh, society has different words for it. And this is one of those rare times, rare times, when a European's like, ah, yes, we'll use your word for it. <laughs> because otherwise we're going to be like sharp, pointy lava versus right. smooth lava. <laughs> like, that, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, ah, uh, and hoi hoi is so much more fun. Arch just made a really good point. Oh, thank you, but I'm going to have one as soon as I'm done. I got five minutes. <laughs> the fire was out. Um, um, hi. Yeah. hi. <laughs> You're not wrong, per se, but yeah. Um, Arch said, I just lost it, sorry. Arch said, <laughs> I believe the prehistoric word for fire was ouch. That's funny. Um, or hot. Those ex- Oh, so basically the Greeks had more love than any other culture. So, okay, I'm going to turn my thing off. Um, so what's interesting is I want to point out that when a language compared to another language doesn't have a word for something, it's called a lacuna, L-A-C-U-N-A. L-A-C-U-N. Yeah, well, I've, I've heard of this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, for example, um... I think this is the easy example in English. We have the word virgin, but we don't have a word for not a virgin. <laughs> um, I think, oh no, I have, I have some really good ones. Okay. It's German. Okay. Germans. You have socks. I don't remember what the word for it is, but there's a goddamn word for sock. Okay. They do not have a word for mittens. Their word is hand sock. There you go. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That is or what like, it is. Some languages don't have a word for shallow, so it works out to something like not so deep. <laughs> it's like the phrasing. That you're dizzy because you're running around too much. Mommy has three minutes and I'm finished. Okay. Um, so, right. So, there's, so, for example, in languages that don't have color words, okay, they might say something is sky colored or tree colored or blood colored, or they have yeah, another way of saying They'll use it. a description of something right. in their environment to describe the same. So the thing. presence or absence of a word in the language doesn't preclude the people who use that language's ability to understand a concept. So that, that brings up another topic. <laughs> and I'll be very quick about this one about how an idea in one language cannot necessarily be represented in another. Right. Like time. It's time is a construct. Everybody fucking loves that quote, but let's let's discuss this. Um I'm I'm thinking specifically oh I I wanna say I wanna say Sol is it the Solomon Islands where they no it's the yams people. Why the fuck do I to think of the yams people? Oh, look at that. That's so cute. Time is a construct. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Time is a there's, there is a, there's a group of peoples that Morality. were a while back. And I want to say that they're in, they're either in New Guinea or they're in South America. And I can't remember which, which grouping this is, but they literally, they literally describe the time of year based off of the harvest of yams. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yam harvesting time. Like for them, I think it's actually like spring for us. Like it's, it's a weird, um, cause they're South of the equator. So it's like, it's fall for them, but that's no, that's, there's no such thing as autumn or fall. It is simply, yeah, I'm harvesting time or right. I'm planting time or like, like how many, how, how old are you? I am five yams. I and have, I have, I've witnessed five harvests. I love that. Yeah. And I think that's like a really important spot to end on is that like what we said earlier, that language is culture. We don't put cultures in a higher, well, you shouldn't 
put cultures in a hierarchy by saying like this culture is like better or more advanced. Oh, yeah. or more, right? I hate that shit. Don't so like we have to be careful when we talk about language because if it's something is a language, one language is not somehow inferior or superior to another language just because right. it lacks or has a feature that another language does or doesn't have. Well, it's, I think we get into a very slippery slope with that when they use oh, the, the right, gestural right. language argument about evolution because they try to conflate it with like American Sign Language. And I think that that is extremely disrespectful. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. That's the other thing with our, uh, with anthropology as a whole. We don't call someone of, of native or indigenous or, or different culture um, simplistic. We don't call them, uh, uh, what's what's that term that, uh, it's literally, it's it's written off of us. Uh, it, mm, not primal. What's the word? Um, Carnal? Fucking, primitive? What? Primitive. We don't use the term primitive. Right. I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is how much I don't use that goddamn word. I have a hard time remembering it because mm -hmm. that word in and of itself has a bias towards seeing another culture as less than or even if it's even if it is younger it doesn't matter it's it's right. less important or or it is um behind the rest of us that, that word in my field is nonverbal i don't use that term ever not oh yeah oh yeah let's mm, i stopped using that a while back uh, like i i i understand nonverbal is you stopped is using the word nonverbal non communicative or non uh, can be a thing or like so like well, so they used to use the term nonverbal autism, which is yeah, I'm I'm well no -no. familiar with that for my previous I job. I like just so that's why we're like high functioning, low functioning, but even high functioning and low functioning is still kind of fucked up. Yeah, there is oh, there's just non like verbal uh, is a yeah. clinical non-starter. It doesn't tell me anything about what kind of communication that that person yeah. Uses. Are they hand gestures? Do they make facial expressions? Do right. they turn their back to you before talking? Like, is that, there... It also doesn't tell me anything about their receptive language, so what they can understand versus their expressive language, what they can communicate to other people. Yes. And yeah. more often than not, when I see a doctor write in a chart that a patient's nonverbal, I go in there and they make lots of communicative behaviors, including talking. I yeah. had a patient the other day tell me exactly what part of their body hurt when I reposition them in bed, and that they have been trained nonverbal for like seven days. See, that's like, the, yeah. that's the fucked yeah. up thing is is whenever yeah, because I take I'm on the spectrum as well, and I take things literally as they come in. Like my input is the is is like the literal translation of of what's going on, and I remember as like a kid being told something was priceless and I was like, so like, it's free. Right. Like <laughs> I didn't understand this, but like, then someone was like, Oh yeah. And then this person has nonverbal autism. And like, I went in there, I'm like, they are yelling. That is, that's very verbal. <laughs> there is lots of noise. <laughs> so and say they don't use verbal communication at this time. They're not speaking. And let me be clear. If someone, who is neurodivergent wants to, the word nonverbal to be used to describe them? That is a hundred percent valid. I don't. I just don't want but care using providers. Using diagnosis is right. Not. And people around yeah, people who are neurodivergent for, yeah. giving that label to a person. Like you don't introduce me. I don't play the piano. I don't know how to play the piano. You don't introduce me as a non-pianist. Right. So, like, that's why we talk. Why oh, we my God. You just opened the a door for me describing penis. so many other people now. Like, I, I'm going to go up to, like, I'm going to go up to James and be like, he's a non-guitarist. Yeah. But we don't like, do that. It doesn't matter that he has else. So, why are we doing it with, with like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I yeah. must, It was wonderful having you on. We it's, need to talk more because we just, we just, like, just barely like, scratched the, the surface like <laughs> barely the, language is, such a is fucking amazing and the topic. thing is it is oh. just not studied enough i mean like it's just now getting to its popular popularity is not the word i want to use um it's now getting the respect that it deserves sure. within the, the study the attention. it's getting attention attention yes yeah can i can um, i leave everyone with like a thought experiment 
Yeah, fucking yeah. Fuck with their heads. Do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Captain's like, no, don't do that. Captain's <laughs> like, there's a lot of info that it just got like splatted in his face. He doesn't know. So, <laughs> earlier we talked about like why is it it's that hard for humans, me to process things. Anyway. <laughs> human beings are the only ones that demonstrate like symbol use, which in our case would be language. That's what we're interested in, right? The other thing too is that language is not and cannot, and I'm gonna stand on a hill be explicitly taught. So language is acquired. Language is acquired. Is and acquired. if someone wants proof of that, I could send you 900 textbooks, 3000 articles, research articles. We acquire language. We do not explicitly sit our children down and teach them and the was that past tense, blah, blah. They, they acquire language through being exposed to it and we will only acquire language being exposed to it through social means. You cannot put a child in front of a television and have them passively receive information about language and have them acquire it. It must be a communication, a back and forth, That's a right. dialogue. Otherwise, they will not learn a language. And for children who um, might be neurodivergent and demonstrate delays or different communications or language, stuff like that, there is a period of critical development where if you don't have intervention services to try to help that child, you know, access communication <laughs> modalities, you will reach a ceiling very quickly. Um, and you kind of lose the opportunity to um, have them acquire language that we consider acceptable in neurotypical circles. Right. Are you clear about that? Well, so this is, that, that is acquired, not learned, right? You, you can learn to write. We teach, we sit down and go, this is an A, this is a B. We do that, right? We teach yeah. them to wipe their bums. We teach them to ride a bike. But you do not sit down and explicitly teach your child language. And, no, and this, there's a this really is great a video that everyone can watch where a, a, I think it was a speech pathologist or she may have been a linguist or anthropologist put up video cameras in her house and recorded every single utterance her child made until they made their first word. And then mapped them out every time the child had made a communication utterance in the con the first word was water and it was like the sink was running they were in the bathtub blah blah and like mapped it out to show like how many the understanding examples. of that word right how many yeah. examples do they have to have when did they demonstrate the receptive understanding of the word water and then when did it actually come out as something that was like a proto word which you can get into that's amazing languages but okay like, we know that it's not explicitly taught that that's a fact just last night mm -hmm. my um my five-year-old, my youngest, um, I had a bout of insomnia. I was up until like 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. And my youngest comes downstairs. He's bawling his eyes out. He's like, Daddy, oh. I had a nightmare. So he cried in my chest for a few minutes. And then he set up and it was like, I want to watch TV instead of my dreams. That Word for word, that's what he said. I want to watch TV instead of my dreams. Aww. It's like... You can absolutely fucking watch TV. Holy shit. After that, that was the most heartbreaking sentence you could have ever. But like that's that's how we like he And he generated that sentence. Yeah. Yeah. From his inventory of vocabulary words and his understanding of grammar that he acquired through the social relationship that he has with his family. Yeah. And for no, and there's no other way. We have not yet been able to demonstrate. Let me say that. We have it not is. yet been able to demonstrate any possibility of a person or an animal acquiring the ability to generate novel utterances through operant conditioning or explicit training. It doesn't exist. It, it might be the most fascinating part about being a parent is watching your kids grow up and articulate their thoughts and emotions in ways that they can and then you as the parent having to try to interpret what they're trying to say right and like they're, they're only using the tools that they have to right. communicate with you and you're just like okay i think what you're trying to say is x y and z right. it's it, it's really interesting to watch no, um, it's the yeah, that, 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 that literally happened last night, and I was like, yeah. oh, my God, that was adorable. Yeah, that, that's, that's really, really sweet. I had a kid I was babysitting say, um, 
he wanted me to put his food in the hot freezer. And I was like, the hot freezer? The hot freezer. He meant the microwave. You just right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, I'm I familiar with like, that. I, I, you know what? I think those are very sweet moments. Um, I would like to end the show on a note of miscommunication rather than communication itself, which is when a child has been taught a word but cannot pronounce it properly. So we are left very confused. Uh, I've had plenty of those case, moments in my life. Don't feel linguistic prescriptivist. <laughs> oh, I, I. Are there proper ways to pronounce words? Oh no 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 no! I love. <laughs> I love the way that this is communicated. I am very sad that they took away his speech impediment and fixed it. Right. I I wanted him to say this his whole life. His uh, my nephew would pronounce the word vacuum very uniquely. It came out fuck you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yep, typically. I was like, yeah. "Is mommy going to fuck you?" <laughs> Maybe later. Yes. Yeah. Mommy's gonna my, fuck you. My all son over loves the living yeah. room and the dining yeah. room and the bedroom. Yeah. I my sister was mortified. My this is a this is a step sibling and they are Mormon. Um, so they are like, we need to fix this now. And I'm like, don't do it. That's it's so, so cute. <laughs> like I need to keep this that. forever. <laughs> My, All right, my so we got... son loves smooth jazz, but he can't say smooth, so he calls it snooze. S N O O V. It's my favorite. Smooth. I love it. Smooth. Jazz. It's All right, what's our super when my, something? Super jazz. When 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 my oldest was the only child, and it would rain, he would go, "Oh no, Wayne!" Oh I, no, I, it, Wayne! It was just the most. I I can't recreate it for you guys, but trust me, it was the most fucking adorable. <laughs> He was like, oh, no, Wayne. Like, he would look That's out the window. Like, oh, no, so, oh, my God. I miss. You'll enjoy miss those days. When anyway. you use W for R, that's called gliding. It's a phonological process. And it's it and is. It's, it's normal and it's understood. Well, normal, whatever that is. It's expected among neurotypical, targeted learning children. Um, and we all under, that's why we understand what they're saying because we can fill in the R for the W in most words. So. Makes sense. So I was told at a young age, because I went to a speech speech pathologist, um, mm -hmm. because I didn't talk much. Okay. And when I did talk, I sounded like I was from Boston. Okay. <laughs> Even when I spoke French. And my mother could not figure out for the love of like she just couldn't figure out why. Um I all of my R's came out either airy or with a W. Mm -hmm. I stuttered. And oh, my my SH and CH would get confused a okay. lot. Years went by of me sounding like I was from Boston. <laughs> it just happened all the time. And like I would add L's at the end of my words that end with W. And like I would do all of the things. And I just remember constantly being told by the speech the speech pathologist that. If I just slow down and articulate, I will speak like a normal person. That's how they fucking phrased it. And I hated it. I'm, I am apologize on behalf no, of I know. apologists. No one should ever, ever be using words like that. No, but like, yeah, no. For like a first grader trying to figure shit out, like that it's was cool. fucking traumatizing to be like, I'm not normal. What? <laughs> like, I says, I we all see. know I'm not normal, so it's fine. I lost an entire school year of lunchtime being punished to learn to spell. It was the once the done thing in education to sit down. Yeah. No, I Can remember. You please acknowledge the that. struggle of people to learn to. So reading and writing is a convention that was invented by that. I will say we have an archaeological That's a whole other thing we can get on. record of reading and writing. We don't know kind of where it generated from. That's that's for next time. We'll get into that. Yeah. But we do have a record of that that we can follow. And it is a convention. So it would be like being punished for not being able to learn to ride a bike. And we're so, we're, we harp on literacy so much. There are plenty of people in this world who are not functionally literate, who have made perfect lives for themselves, got married, had children, ran businesses. And being literate, your, your literacy, and whether or not you have her dyslexia or whatever, is not a reflection of your intelligence. No, not at all. Ever. No. 
they'll be like saying, if you can't play piano, you're stupid or something like that. It, it is not, it is a convention. It is something that people have invented for, it's a tool. And if you yeah. have trouble learning how to use that tool, that doesn't matter. Well, it's, it's, I am a strong believer that a trade uh, is also a passion mm-hmm. and that that should be what is nurtured in education and not to say that like it's not it's not bad to have like a little bit of everything kind of thrown in there mm-hmm. and you should but at some point you're going to exhibit skills in a certain area and you should push those to their to their limits and see how far you can get and not be fucking restrained because calculus wasn't your thing so fucking what you don't need calculus if you're uh, well yeah you might but very unlikely that you'll like you'll need calculus to be like a lawn like a, a landscape manicurist or something like say you make you make goddamn rainbows out of fucking shrubs that is amazing you're a fucking artist I don't know anything about pruning fucking bushes, but that's amazing. <laughs> fucking do that shit. What is the difference between teaching and acquiring? So, I Ooh, can I that's answer? A good question. Or you got one? It, we probably have different answers for this. Um, we still do not know what exactly is going on in the brain in the first couple of years of life that allow us to acquire language, but when you like potty train a child, right? You're explicitly being like instruction number one. There's like a task analysis, right? There's Watch you potty, pull off pants, pull off underwear. Like is it, there's these things that you're teaching and explaining. You, we, we may model certain words like this is blue. It's blue, but like we don't model and the is going. Like we don't do any of that. So we just kind of acquire grammar. There's like this universal grammar and all grammar in every language, but like there's two exceptions and we can talk about that next time, has like the, the same components in it. It talks, like it has these certain components. There's morphology, syntax, tense, casing, word order, declension. Like there's all these things that like have to be in there and they're in every language. So that, I think that does point to, if we're going to go down like the evolutionary route, there's like a commonality, like a common ancestor of like a proto language that like evolve. I mean, I could, I could argue that's fine. There, so, there are cultural oh rules God. that are followed in grammar between languages that do not correspond with other languages, right. but will have an exact replica in a different order. Adjectives. I'm talking about adjectives right now. <laughs> Oh yeah, we intrinsically know what order of the different types. Yeah, of I I can't going. think of the list, but I can I can look it up and and give you the whole list. Of the well, ideas. you can just describe anything. Like this is a, a blue plastic cup. If I said it was a plastic blue cup, you'd be like, that sounds weird. Yeah, there's oh god, there's there's a fucking oh, this is there's another algorithm. This is another time we can talk. All about right, it. we need to end the show. This this yeah, we is. Do fucking awesome I'm, I'm really enjoying this i really am and i want to I, god this but, is an amazing topic and i want to keep going with it we, we could we could do this for fucking hours we like, could and the but the subject that's of it, linguistics it, is just stop. <laughs> it's so fucking broad it's so cool um, like we haven't even gotten to the basis where we can go back and start talking about biblical we, we have any scrap the barriers just, but so, now the viewers have like a baseline of like our definitions and where we're coming from so yeah. we can talk about how this applies to like interpreting scripture and how you have to be careful about those things think it'll make more sense that's it's one of my biggest pet peeves when people are like oh yeah they just kind of lost that in translation i'm like how yeah that's a whole thing what's your evidence now you're getting into my territory all right i could fucking go okay next next time on nerds and heresy (laughs) (laughs) thank you everybody for joining thank you so much for the super chats uh, I can't thank you enough for those. What is that? Uh, thanks, what is that? For for of Hopefully course. Will, thanks for uh, having me. In the near future. It's always nice. And I love having you on. And I'm going to probably grab Morgan for the next time that we're on. Because yeah. uh, he's going to want to start talking about the uh, the cultural analysis behind language rather than just the evolutionary understanding. So Yeah, he, he was supposed to join tonight, but he was unable to. Oh, oh he- get this, Amos. He wanted to go see Jane Goodall speak. I know. Tonight. That, that's why Tonight. he couldn't join us. He went and saw her lecture. 
I am jealous. Anyway, yeah. good night, everyone. He's preparing, he's preparing for our next conversation because I got a lot to say about Django. Oh, we gotta get into the we gotta get into the ape talk. Naughty, naughty. All right. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. I appreciate y'all. Um, stay tuned for more bullshit. I'm very bad at naming shows. So good night.